thank you for tuning in. Thank, welcome to New Life Church Online. My name is Pastor Ted, and I've got a message for you. We're going to be talking today about facing temptation. Now, before you run and go hide and scream and say, no, no, not that. I just want to give you, uh, let you know some things. First of all, you realize we preachers have a problem? Yep. I want you to think of it this way. Workout videos. Um, you look at those. I mean, those are done by people who have sculptured bodies. There's no fatties allowed. Uh, I mean, just like, you know, the, the Arnold Schwarzeneggers and, you know, just the beautiful people, you know, that with the rippling muscles, they're the ones who do all the exercise videos. Um, can you imagine if they, if I did an exercise video, I mean, look at this beautiful physique. I don't think so. Have you ever noticed that beauty products are promoted by beautiful women? I mean, drop dead gorgeous beautiful women not by the women who need those products it's just you know it's just the, well you get the idea and if you think about it by these standards no preacher is ever qualified to preach the message that we preach because all have sinned and can fall short of the glory of god the uh, every time i preach i am fully aware that i am a flawed broken preacher who is preaching a perfect gospel. I need the gospel as much as you do, if not more. Well, no, we all need the gospel. We need the gospel. And so I'm aware of this as I preach on this particular subject because I too struggle with temptation. It's with me all the time. I think it's going to be with us until the end of our days when, when uh, Jesus calls us home. That's when temptation will end. So very practical message coming up. So I'll tell you what, let's turn in your Bibles. Um, got your Bible right here. Get yourself a little notebook. You can. Uh, uh, we're going to start with James chapter one, and we're going to just basically open to James chapter one. Stay there, and then jot down on your piece of paper the other verses that I'm quoting here. I'm basically going to quote them, and I'll let you look them up later. So, but I do want you to have James chapter one in front of you, Father. I pray right now, help me as I preach on this touchy subject, temptation. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, James chapter one, we're going to be looking, we're going to be starting with uh, verse 12. Let me go ahead and read this for you. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. How does, how does that work? Well, I'll tell you what, let's look at the story of Job. Do you find this in Job chapter one? Just write that, ver that, that down, Job chapter one, write it down, come back, look at it later, but let me read it to you. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, fearing God and avoiding evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Come to think of it, that's a lot of diapers. We won't go there. His possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and many, many servants. So back then, and even still in many parts of the Middle East, your, your wealth is measured by the livestock that you own. I saw... When I was stationed over in the, in the Saudi Arabia for the Persian Gulf, um, there were many, many very rich, I mean, we're talking filthy rich men who they drove around in their, in their fancy BMWs and Mercedes and all these uh, high class cars, yet they still kept a whole bunch of camels in order to flaunt their wealth. That was how they measured it back then. The Bible here even says that this man, Job, was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and make a feast in the house of each on his day, and they would send and call for their three sisters to come and eat with them. So in other words, each son would hold a, a feast in their house, one on Monday, one on Tuesday, one on Wednesday. You get the point, all the way, seven days. And the daughters were, were always invited to come over, and they all feasted together on each day. And verse 5 says, and when the days of feasting had run their course, Job sent and sanctified them. He would rise up early in the morning and he would offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. Because Job says, you know, it may be 
that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, Job would do always. You know, if you had more men that would pray for their children, including the adult children, just when the child turns 18, your, your duties to pray for your kids have not ended at that point. So let's sum it up. Job had it made. I mean, made the shade, as we used to say. But what we need to do is we need to pull back the curtain and look at what's happening in the throne room of God. Now, there was a day when the sons of God, those who were referring to the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord. And the adversary, Satan, came among them. By the way, the word Satan means adversary. So that's a good way to translate that. Verse 7, and the Lord said to the adversary, from where have you come? And the adversary answered the Lord and saying, from roaming on the earth and way walking up and down on it, back and forth. And, you know, that's what he does today. Even he's, he's wandering around uh, looking to, to whom it, whatever tr trouble and mischief he can cause. He, that's what he's up to. And the Lord said to the adversary, have you considered or targeted? I think it's a good way to put that too. Have you targeted my servant Job? that there is none like him in all the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and avoids evil. Have you put a target on his back? And the adversary answered the Lord and says, has Job feared God for nothing? You have, have you not made a, a hedge around him and around his household and around against all that he, and, and uh, around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. Uh, he's accusing him of uh, serving God for selfish reasons, but stretch out your hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. That was his accusation kind of a taunting accusation i would say and the lord said to the adversary look all that he has is in your power only do not stretch out your hand against his person now a couple of things i want to point out here number one satan is limited to what god gives him permission to do it's only so much he can do against you because God gives him that permission. The second thing I want to point out is, notice it is Satan who is the one attacking Job, not God. Not God. It is a rather offensive in, in many ways when the, the insurance form, you know, when you, if you suffer a loss due to a natural disaster, they call it an act of God. It's not always God. <laughs> so let's just uh, be real here. So the adversary departed from the presence of the Lord. Okay, on the mission. So here's what happened. Now, if you're not driving, if you're driving, you better pay attention to the road. I won't want to cause any accident. But if you're not driving, I want you to kind of kick back, close your eyes. I want you to envision what this must have been like for Job. Here we go. So a day came when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job saying, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them. And the Sabians came, attacked them and took them away. And they, were, they killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I am the only one who escaped to tell you, I'm the, old, the sole survivor. And even while he was still yet speaking, I didn't even finish his sentence. Another one comes running in. Another came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I am the only survivor. While he was still speaking, they didn't even let Job catch his breath. While he was still speaking, another came and said, the Chaldeans formed three companies and they made a raid of the camels and have taken them away, and they killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And yep, you guessed it. I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, could it get worse? Another came. Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking in the eldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. 
within a matter of minutes. Everything and everyone who is dear to Job is gone. Only his wife is left. And those of you who know the story, you know, in the next chapter, she tells him, curse God and die. He is devastated. He has been hit with every disaster that life could throw at him. And verse 20 says, Job stood up and he tore his robe. He shaved his head and he fell to the ground and worshiped. Can you worship when things go wrong? That's a tough question. It's a tough question. And you'll never really know the answer until you're in that position. Even if it's not nearly as severe as what Job uh, was, was suffering. But when things go wrong, do you worship or do you murmur? Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin, and he did not accuse God of wrongdoing. Here's the point. It was not God who did these things to him. Satan did it. And there was one other point. I'm trying to remember what it was. Anyway. I'm not going to go back and try to find that. Okay. So the point is, it says, in fact, this will help me remember. James chapter one, verse 13. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. It wasn't God doing it to him. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tend to tempt anyone. So, but verse 14, this is where the temptation comes in. I want you to see this, but everyone is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires or lusts and enticed. Flip Wilson had it wrong. Those of you who are younger, look it up. Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. No, the devil can't make you do it. That does not, that's not how it worked. Um, it's like fishing. I want you to. I want you to get this picture. I remember when we were growing up in Chippewa Lake, Ohio. My my dad and I used to go out the washing worms, as he used to call it, and uh, you know he used to get a you know uh, hose down this one section behind the, the barn, and and uh, and and then in the morning when he would come back, there was all these you know uh, big big worms. I mean, we're talking these great big worms, and he'd pick them up, put them in a can. We'd all go out. And he would, we would each, uh, we would take a new worm and, you know, put it on the hook. And, uh, and when you put that in the water, the fish see the worm, not the hook. That's important to remember. So the, so the fish are drawn to the worm. Here's how this, is, this correlates. Sin is alluring. You know, the TV shows show you the, the glamorous side of sin. You know, the, the Las Vegas lights and the casino and the, the limousines and the, and the guys with the girls who are, who are nothing more than eye candy, quite honestly, um, you know, hanging off of his arm. Um, I mean, Las Vegas is so attractive. But, you know, they, they, there's a reason why they call Las Vegas the city of lost wages. That's what I call it anyway. Uh, sin, Satan always hides the hook. Remember that Satan always hides the hook. You realize drug dealers, what's their rule? The first fix is always free. That's where the hook is. And then once they, once you got that one, you're hooked, you're addicted and it's real in is all this. It now keep in mind, there is no truth in advertising when it comes to sin. No truth in advertising. The hook is always being hidden here. Um, let's look at the, the Garden of Eden. We're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 3. Just write that down. I'll read it to you. So here we are. We got Eve is right there. And the serpent comes up to her. And, you know, and the serpent said to the woman, you shall surely not die. 
For God knows that on the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Mark that phrase. You will be like God. Look at what the many of the TV preachers, the false teachers on TV are, are telling you. You are little gods. You have creative power. You have power like God because you're made in the image of God. You shall be like God. <laughs> Sound familiar? Satan said to her, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. I got to think, what's the difference there? You see, up until this point, they knew good. They didn't know evil. So he says, on that day, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. He's accusing God of holding out on Adam and Eve. You know, God's not giving you the good stuff. I want you to understand, Adam and Eve had it made, kind of like Job, but even more so. They had everything they need. They Life was perfect, literally. There was no sickness, no disease, no, there was, there was only one rule. I mean, how, how hard is that? They had it perfect, and yet Satan had them buffooned into thinking that God was holding out and wasn't being a, a good provider for him. Now, let's, let's give you the, the anatomy of the temptation at work. Genesis 3.6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasing to the eyes and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate. She gave to her husband with her, and he ate. You know, the turkey was right there watching the whole thing come down. He didn't say one word. Ouch. So 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, I, I, I'm often amazed at how many Christians, uh, I was here too, by the way, how many amazed how many Christians say, please, Jesus, don't come before I get married or have a baby or get a million dollars or get that perfect job. Don't, don't come yet. I'm still having fun. Do not love the things of the world or the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, verse 16, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. Now I want you to, uh, uh, let's compare them to the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh. It was pleasing to the eyes, lust of the eyes. It was desirable to make one wise, the pride of life. See how they line up? Think about that. That's the anatomy of the temptation. Let's go back to James. James 1.15. Then when desire or you could put the word lust in there, has conceived. It gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives, brings forth death. Sin is a slow-acting poison. Tastes sweet at first. It bites in the end. And it brings, down, brings you to death. The world and its desires are passing away. But the one who does the will of the Father lives forever. Now, so here's, how, here's what Satan does. He dangles this enticing goodies before us. But always remember, Satan always hides the hook. He always hides the hook. Okay, let me give you some principles and write these down for uh, about sin. Okay, principle number one, sin is always fun for a season for a season, for a time. Hebrews 11, 24 and 25 says, by faith, Moses, when he became a full age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God, underline this next phrase, rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a time, a season, okay? Number two, sin will catch up to you. Genesis, excuse me, not Genesis, Galatians. We'll get the right book here. Galatians 6, 
verses seven and eight. Write that one down. And it says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Whatever you sow, you will reap. You, plunk, you plant pumpkin seeds, you're going to get pumpkins. If you plant an apple tree, you're going to get apples. Now, verse 8. For the one who sows to his flesh, fleshly, carnal, selfish things, will from the flesh reap corruption. Corruption is like, like when meat spoils and, and it, 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 it dies. But to the one who sows to the spirit, will from the spirit reap eternal life. Whatever you sow, that you will reap. You see this principle illustrated in Numbers 32, 23, where Moses tells Achan, but if you will not do so, you have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. Think of it this way. You can't sow wild oats and then pray for a crop failure. It doesn't work. You will reap. Okay. Uh, I read the recently about a very cheap man who was looking for a gift for a friend. I mean, he was a cheapskate. Whew. Everything was too expensive except for a broken glass vase, which he could purchase for almost nothing. An idea popped into his head. He asked the store to send it, hoping that his friend would think that this expensive vase was broken in transit. It's a thought that counts, right? In due time, the man received an acknowledgement from his friend. Thank you for the vase at Red. It was so thoughtful of you to wrap each piece separately. His sin found him out. James chapter 1, verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brother. There's so many times when Jesus said, do not be deceived. James is saying, do not be deceived. What is it we're being deceived about? Adam and Eve in the garden. Satan says, God's holding out on you. Verse 17 says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. See, God is not holding out on you. He's not. The devil tries to tell you, ah, oh, you're missing out on all this fun. Phooey. He's got a hook. Watch out. Okay. So every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the shadow of the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Verse 18. But of his own will, he brought us forth. The old King James says, he begot us. Born again. It's a phrase you're looking for. He made us born again by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation, of all his creatures. Think of it this way. God gives the good gifts. Satan offers a substitute. I suppose another word you could look for there is counterfeit. So how do we handle temptation? Uh, this is, I know this is where you're looking for. Well, you know, you're looking for that to-do list. How do I fit? How do I do handle this? Right? Okay. What magical formula, Ted? Hey, can you give us that'll make us immune to temptation? You're not gonna like it. <laughs> Principle number one: If it gets too hot in the kitchen, get out. Verse eighteen: Flee fornication. Flee fornication. Run, get out of there. You can't handle it. Don't think you can duke it out with the devil. No, nope, can't do it. Flee fornication. Look at Joseph, Genesis 39, verses 6 through 13. Let me read it for you here. It says, now Joseph was handsome and well-built. He was a stud. Oh, man. Um, yeah, he's the kind that, uh, you know, you know, that the ladies, uh, you know, would, you know, would, would take pictures, you know, and, you know, Chippendale, stuff like that. Yeah, he was a, he was a, a handsome dude. 
And after that, that his master's wife, talking about Potiphar, took notice of Joseph. And she, I, I imagine she just in the most seductive voice she can come up with and said, lie with me. An invitation for sex. But he refused and said to his master's wife, my master does not concern himself with anything concerning me in the house. And he has committed all that he has to my charge. He's put me in, he, he trusts me. There is none greater in this house than I, and he has kept nothing back from me, but you, because you are his wife. Here's a verse for you. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God. Here's the point. All sin is against God. All sin is against God. Now, she spoke to, Faye, to Joseph every day. Every day, every daily, daily, daily. Come lie with me. Come lie with me. Come, you know, come on. Come on. Let's get it on. But he would not listen to her about lying with her or even being with her. He was avoiding the appearance of evil. Now, Billy Graham had a rule that he would not be alone with a woman unless his wife was there. Good rule. I mean, it really was. Uh, former Vice President Mike Pence had the same rule that he would not, he would not be alone uh, with any woman without his wife being present. They caught him. He violated that rule. He took his mom out to dinner. Anyway, Billy Graham's rule, he, he was so strict on this. When he was uh, in the beginning of his career, when he was traveling from place to place, holding all these crusades, one of the things that he did, which was very smart, is he would, uh, when he checked into a hotel, he would ask the hotel clerk or the manager of the hotel to go to the room with him and to unlock the door and go into the room to make sure that the room was empty. The thing he was concerned about, and I could, I could see this happening, um, them having, having the room all set up, he goes into the room, and as soon as he walks into a room, a scantily clad woman would jump into his arms and there's a photographer to take a picture. You know, blackmail. He guarded against that. Joseph was doing the same thing. You need to set up boundaries. You need to set up boundaries, men. Ladies, you too. Make sure that you don't find yourself in any compromising situation. Even if nothing happens, the appearance of evil is enough to ruin your reputation. Just thought I'd warn you about that. Now, it happened that one day when Joseph went about to the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were there, it was a trap. And she caught him by his clothing and saying, lie with me compromising situation she's lying there who knows what if anything she's wearing and she's got him her hands her clothes his clothing caught in her fingers and the bible says he left his clothing with her and he fled and he got outside the principle there is called beat feet and boogie get out of there flee fornication run you can't handle it Next, next, uh, next uh, principle for, for, for facing temptation. Number two, make no provision for the flesh. Romans 13, 14 says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a good one right there. Put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. So put on Christ, make no provision for the flesh let me uh um let me uh advise you to do this make an inventory of those things that trip you up the things that make you sin i had a friend put, uh, say it this way he said there are no eclairs in the fridge now obviously i for one have had a lot of trouble over the years with things i love to eat i love to eat and my body shows it now if i were to buy eclairs and take it home and say, oh, man, I'm on a diet. I'm not supposed to eat this thing. Oh, what am I going to do? I'm going to put it in the fridge. Put it in the fridge, close the door. Nope. There's eclairs in the fridge. 
Oh man, that would taste so good right now. Oh man, I can't get this out of my mind. I know what I'll do. I'm going to take the open up the refrigerator door and I'm going to put the eclairs behind the mayonnaise. There's no such thing as out of sight, out of mind. You got to get rid of that eclair. So get rid of any material which you'd be ashamed to show your pastor. I'm talking about movies. I'm talking about books. I'm talking about magazines. Um, Gentlemen, what's on your browser history? Get take if you have to um, if you have to get a, a filter, I don't care. Um, get rid of any of these temptations, any of these things. Um, you got to get rid of it. Remember, what you do in public is your reputation, but what you do in private. When you think nobody is watching, that, gentlemen, is your character. That is who you really are. And finally, probably the most important one, get right with God. Get right with God. If you're not saved, oh my. Look at the thief on the cross. Luke 23, 39 and following tells his story. And one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you're the Christ, save us yourself and us. But the other one rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? For we indeed are justly ju condemned. For we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man, Jesus, has done nothing. And then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He put his faith in Jesus right at that moment. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell, I tell you, today, today you will be with me in paradise. He got saved right up there on the cross. And then in Luke 18, verses 9 through 14, he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves as though they were righteous and despised others, the Pharisees, in other words. We got a lot of people who think, I'm righteous, I'm good. God's not going to throw me in hell. Listen to the parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Yeah, they weren't very popular back then either. Then the Pharisee stood and prayed all these things about himself. The old King James says, and he prayed to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this filthy tax collector. Why, I fast twice a week. I tithe of all that I earn. He's praying on and on and on to himself, about himself. But the tax collector, standing at a distance, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but looking down. But he struck his chest, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I tell you, Jesus said, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Familiar passage of scripture, John chapter three, starting with verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. The story behind that is when God sent snakes into the camp because they were, they were complaining. They were being bit by these fiery snakes. And God told Moses to make a bronze serpent and put it up on a pole. And the, uh, the familiar medical symbol for the medical profession with the two snakes on a pole, that comes from this particular scripture right here. So when Moses lifted up the serpent on the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. It looked the same way. Jesus dying on the cross was lifted up on a, on a cross. Verse 15, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have, have eternal life. Look at it this way. 
the people, when they, when they were bit by a snake, they had a choice. They could either look to the, to the, at the snake up there on the, on the, the bronze snake and live, or they could avoid it. In the same way, we can look to Jesus and live, or, well, you know what the or is. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 16, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life, everlasting life. How long is everlasting? It's everlasting. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That's talking about his first coming now, but that the world through him might be saved. So now two types of people. One, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who believes, who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Here's the verdict that light has come into the world that men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Men choose to hide their sin. They don't want it to come out into the light because I mean, sin is ugly. It's, it's icky. I'm going to hide that thing. I can handle it. <laughs> Men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that it may be revealed that his deeds have been done in God. You know, being born again means to bring all that ugly sin into the light. Let it be exposed for all its ugliness. This is part of what repenting is all about. You're going to say, guilty, God, here it is. And then you're going to say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. You're going to put your faith in him. It's this process of bringing your sin, the light to your sin. It's a painful process. Bringing all that ugly sin to the light that it might be exposed to the light. So Jesus can wash it away. It's painful, but it's necessary. John 3.36 says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. It is time to get right with God. Do it now. Cry out to him. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. You can't get yourself right with God without coming to him. And having him save you. What are you doing with your sin? Are you hiding it? Or are you bringing it to Jesus? Cry out to Jesus. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner.